Let's look at B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes in more detail. We're going to start with the B lymphocytes. So these are the cells that, again, produce antibodies. B lymphocytes, um, they're not they're not necessarily always just sort of spewing out antibodies. They have to be sort of triggered to do so. And the thing that triggers them to do that is by being exposed to some sort of a pathogenic antigen. So they have to see this particular structure, this particular antigen in order to start ramping up production. So that first exposure, exposure of an antigen to the antibodies on the surface of a B cell, that's kind of like the triggering event. If this antigen is specific to this antibody, um, if they can, can recognize, if the antibody can recognize the antigen, then what's going to happen is this B cell will start replicating itself. It will undergo many rounds of replication, that's called the proliferation, is taking place, and it's just forming a whole bunch of clones of itself. Those clones can do one of two things. Some of them will become what are called memory cells, and memory cells, they don't really actively produce antibodies, rather they just sort of hang out and they literally provide a long-term um, immunological memory for our bodies. So that way, if we are exposed to this particular pathogenic antigen again in the future, um, those memory cells are there and they recall and they help to ramp up production very quickly the next time we're exposed to it. So some of them become memory cells, others become plasma cells. And plasma cells are the real uh, workhorses when it comes to adaptive immunity um, in the sense that they produce a lot of antibodies. Antibodies, they can produce um, 2,000 per second. That's a huge number of antibodies. And if you just look at these two different cell types, so some of them become memory cells, others become plasma cells. Look at the plasma cell inside. Do you see all the rough endoplasmic reticulum? That organelle has really been enlarged in the plasma cells, and that's to allow the cell to make huge amounts of protein. Antibodies are just proteins. Um, sort of a collection of proteins that assemble together. So let's focus in on antibodies for just a minute. Antibodies are also called immunoglobulins. That's another name for them. And there are five major classes of immunoglobulins. Immunoglobulins, are, uh, their names are often abbreviated, IgG, IgA, IgM. These are all different classes of immunoglobulins or antibodies. Um, I'm not going to be testing you on what's the difference between these different types. That would be something that you could, could look up if you're curious or you'll learn about in more detail if you go on and take more cell biology classes or immunology classes. Um, but there are a variety of different types of antibodies and they're very specific. What they all have in common is a characteristic structure. They have a Y-shaped structure. Usually when they're depicted in figures, they're shown as a little Y shape. Um, so in these pictures, the green thing, that's the antibody that's being shown. Here's a B cell and it's got an antibody in green um, sticking off of it. And what we're gonna do is zoom in over here. Let's take a look at this one. This is like a close up of this particular antibody right there. If we look at its structure enlarged, we can see uh, there are really two major regions. There's this lower region that's like the handle. Um, that's called the FC region. The FC region um, is kind of like a, a recognition point. Um, this is very specific to the organism that's producing the antibody. The other end of the antibody, um, so the arms up here, this is called the FAB region, F-A-B. And this is the region that is specific to the antigen, the thing that this antibody can bind to. So right here on the very tips, right, that's where the binding is taking place. And that is what allows this antibody to be extremely specific in terms of what it can recognize. Okay, so the B lymphocytes, again, they're secreting these antibodies um, into circulation but they also have these antibodies embedded on their own surfaces in their own plasma membranes. So that binding that takes place, if this B cell does bind to some sort of pathogen, that binding is the triggering event that causes this B cell to go and prol proliferate itself, make copies, clonal copies of itself. 
We each have a huge number of antibodies. It's estimated that we each have 10 to the 20, that's 100 million trillion antibodies um, just present within our bodies. And um, some of those are, are sort of duplicates of each other. Some of them are the same types of antibodies. But if we were to just categorize how many different types of antibodies we have, even so, there are still a few million different types, a few million different antibodies. They can recognize a few million different things. So that's a huge amount of diversity. And the, the, the idea is that we, we should have an antibody present um, in our bodies, an antibody to be able to deal with every sort of antigen that we might encounter. Okay, so, right, there are a huge number of foreign molecules that you may be exposed to at one point in time or another. Maybe you get a cut, um, depending on what it is that, that caused the cut, it's going to be a different set of pathogens that make their way into the body. So, um, this kind of brings up the question, what is it that that allows that diversity. So uh, our genomes are not large enough to encode for that many different antibodies. So this is kind of, this is a really curious thing. How do we have so many different antibodies? Uh, there are a few different reasons why we end up with so many different ones. One of which is the fact that when B cells are proliferating, they undergo, it's kind of like a really high rate of mutation. It's called somatic hypermutation. They're somatic cells, in other words, not germline cells. Um, and when they divide, when they proliferate, this leads to a huge increase in diversity. Um, there are a couple of other mechanisms as well that contribute to, to antibody diversity, um, shuffling the proteins into different combinations would do this. Uh, but in any case, there are non-genetic reasons why we have a lot of diversity, and there are also genetic reasons why we have a lot of diversity. So a few different things come together in order to provide this huge variety. Um, so antibodies, we've said that they bind to pathogens, but what does that do? Does that kill the pathogen? No, is the simple answer. Antibodies do not directly cause destruction of pathogens. Instead, they act like little flags. They tag things so that other immune cells can come over and deal with the pathogen. So they act like markers. They stick to the pathogen and provide something that our, other ce that our cells can recognize. They also, in the case of viruses, um, binding of antibodies to virus particles helps to block the virus's ability to make it into a target cell. So it acts kind of like a, a sticky coating and then the virus is just kind of trapped in that coating and it's not gonna be able to cause an infection. Um, but aside from that, they also trigger phagocytosis. So they attract phagocytic cells and um, stimulate phagocytosis. That's called opsonization. And then the other thing that I would like to talk about, I mentioned this in a previous video, uh, let's talk about it now. They induce uh, the complement system. The complement system is something that bridges innate and adaptive immunity. Um, so it's triggered by antibodies, which were part of the adaptive immune response. However, once that triggering happens, um, this is a very non-specific process. So let's take a look at what happens. In the end, this is going to promote lysis of target cells. So the idea is to, to lyse uh, the pathogenic cell that may be present, bacterium or whatever it is. The way that this happens is with a whole set of proteins. They're, this is called the complement system because these proteins are complementary to what the B cells and T cells are doing. They act in a complementary fashion. So first step is for antibodies to bind. This is showing a bacterial membrane right here. So the antibodies recognize, okay, this is a foreign bacteria, let's bind to it. That binding recruits certain proteins from the blood plasma. These are called complement proteins. There are many different complement proteins. Um, they were, I believe, they were named in the order of which they were discovered, not in the order in which they act. So first thing we have here is C4 comes over, those complement proteins bind, and that leads to a whole cascade of events. Um, you do not need to know the cascade of events. What I would like you to know is that in the end, what happens is some of these proteins get inserted into the bacterial membrane. 
this process continues until an entire pore is formed. So what's going to happen is this pore will be assembled in the membrane and that's an open space. Water can flow through there. So this is going to end up leading to lysis of the cell. Water is going to rush inside. The cell is essentially going to split apart. What the fragments do then um, is result in phagocytic cells being attracted to this area and then the phagocytic cells can sort of clean things up, clean up the debris field. So opsonization again will take place and also inflammation will be stimulated. So these fragments um, cause mast cells to release histamine and we know about that, that, that triggers inflammation. So with that, I would like to revisit inflammation one more time. We talked about inflammation in the last set of videos when we were dealing with innate immunity. Let's get a, a better idea here of the complete picture. So let's see, we've got right here, we've got some epidermis. There's a break in the epidermis that allows some bacteria inside where they shouldn't be. Um, we've got some antibodies that recognize that bacteria. So a B cell would come over, recognize it, start really ramping up production of antibodies. Antibodies then would help to come over and coat these bacterial cells that are entering. And uh, that ends up leading to activation of the complement system, which does a couple of things. It helps to recruit neutrophil phagocytic cells. So those come over, they start engulfing bacteria that are in this area. Um, meanwhile, this complement system finishes its job, causes the cell to burst, and the fragments um, also help to, to cause mast cells to release histamine. So that is stimulating inflammation, which causes several different things to happen, one of which is extravasion, ex extravasation, also known as diapedesis. Uh, okay, so immune cells are recruited to this area and this just really helps to localize the infection.